Carrie, here's the question. As I'm, as I'm now reading the bill, um, it uh, seems to bring into question some sections on mental health ITA as well as the chemical dependency ITA. Um, section 2A uh, brings in for a person determined to meet detention criteria as a result of a mental disorder, and then it goes on to, um, so I'm curious if this under, if this puts on hold our current mental health ITA or? It actually, um, so sections one and two are both amending the same section of ITA and what um, my read is clarifying in the hospital association, I know will clarify this if I'm reading this incorrectly, but um, it's adding and just differentiating. Essentially, it's, it's creating mental health already existed in the statute and it's differentiating and teasing out substance abuse for both of those. So this does not change mental health. This law is specifically toward the substance use disorder commitment portions of the Involuntary Treatment Act. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. I, whoever was first to the table, go ahead. Right. Thank, you. thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Lauren Davis and I'm testifying in opposition to Senate Bill 6365. On March 29th, 2016, this chamber passed Ricky's Law. Ricky's Law was named after my best friend who barely survived our system and is now five years in long-term recovery. We owe a debt of gratitude to this committee and particularly to the late Senator Andy Hill for prioritizing this legislation in the year it passed. Since Ricky's Law passed, national news outlets have been full of headlines that read, families seek involuntary commitment laws as key tool in saving opioid addicts and support grows for civil commitment of opioid users. I've even received a phone call from the Delaware Attorney General's office about how they can implement Ricky's Law. As we've waited for implementation, the suffering continues. Just three months ago, I sat in a motel room with a loved one as I watched him desperately stabbing himself over and over with a heroin filled syringe trying to find a vein. He stood there covered in his own blood, weeping. I can't stop, he muttered, I can't stop. I sat up beside him all night to monitor his breathing, repeating, ha repeatedly having to violently shake him awake as he started to overdose, as he began to choke in his sleep, gasping for air. And then I did that again, night after night after night after night, staying awake to make sure he wouldn't stop breathing. Because when someone you love is dying, you don't feel you have a choice. Weeks later, he was admitted to the hospital and told that the infection from IV drug use was so severe in his wrist that his lower arm would have to be amputated. Even with this information, he walked out of the hospital against medical advice, two IV ports still in his arm. The greatest irony of all this, this young man sat right here two years ago next to me testifying in support of Ricky's law. He told how the only thing that had ever previously launched him into recovery was the criminal justice system because he needed to be compelled into treatment. He's still out there on the streets using and every day, every single day, I wake up and I pray that he lives long enough to be helped by the very law that he fought for. Hundreds of families in our state have hung their hearts and their hope on Ricky's law. Please don't take this away from us. Thank you. There's a question for you, Lauren. I, I remember you. Um, you were instrumental and there's no desire here. I just want you to know on reversing Ricky's law. Um, I want this discussion about, frankly, we have inadequate detox facilities. Did your friend that you just um, mentioned, did they try to get, did you, they or you try to get them into a detox facility and there, there just wasn't enough capacity or? He wouldn't go. The Ricky's law is not in effect yet. So I'm just praying he stays alive till April 1st. Okay, thank you. You can go on to some, one of the other people if you want to. Compose yourself. Or I'm okay. You're okay? Right. Yeah. Take Good afternoon, time. Madam Chair and member of the committee. My name is Lori Cross. I am, I am speaking on opposition to Senate Bill 6365. I am a mother of a 28-year-old daughter who for the last 
eight years has been on her journey of addiction as well as mental health. The last eight years, I didn't stop being her mother, but my ability to protect her came to a halt. You see, this mother who's been in countless ER rooms will get the calls, calls from the daughter saying, hey mom, I'm in the ER room, can you come get me? That is my only right as a mom. I will go wherever she is and sit in her little ER room watching her not making sense because she's high, trying to talk sense into her to get treatment, begging her with every fiber of my being, bribing her with anything I could. And all she could say to me, mom, it's okay. I'm not an addict. I can tell the doctors and nurses that she's an addict. I scream at the top of my voice, sometimes crying to them, can't you see my daughter's an addict? She needs help. Look at the charts. This is what, the fourth, fifth time she's been in here from the infections because of IV use, screaming at them, she needs help, she needs treatment. She needs someone on her side who's at the brain for her. But all I get is, I'm sorry, if she doesn't want to get help, all we can do is bandage her up and send her on the way. Recently, my daughter overdosed for the first time. She died in my home. I watched my daughter turn blue, gray, and not breathing. It was my worst nightmare and fears for all parents. But with Narcon, we brought her back to life. We didn't call the EMTs, police, or even the hospitals, because we knew the only thing they would do was out, take her to the hospitals only to let her out, and the journey of her addiction starts all over again. So once again, my daughter walks away into the dark of the night, back to the streets to get her next fix. Ricky's Law would give me the right to be her parent again, to be the healthy brain for her. I would get the right to involuntary commit my daughter for at least 72 hours until she gets evaluated. I'm begging you, don't let my daughter have a second time to over because she probably won't make it. I have fought hard for Ricky's Law and have been counting the days until April 1st, 2018 so I can be the parent again that my daughter needs. Ricky's Law can save my daughter's life as well as countless others. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kim Lawrence Thomas, and I am testifying in strong, <clears throat> excuse me, opposition to the Senate Bill 6365. I have a 31-year-old son, Ty. Ty has been abusing drugs and alcohol since his teenage years. In 2015, Tyler overdosed in the bathroom at an Applebee's restaurant. He was transported by ambulance to St. Francis Hospital in Federal Way, Washington in the ER. Social workers asked him if he wanted to go to treatment. He was delirious. He said no, and he was released back to the streets. There was nothing I could do, nor no option for involuntary addiction treatment. Since that day, three years ago, Tyler has become homeless. He is an IV heroin user and meth user. He has acquired hep C and it has remained untreated. He's been arrested two dozen times with many, many incarcerations. If we had been able to involuntarily commit him to addiction treatment under Ricky's law, he could have received the care he needs. All of this could have been avoided. Please don't suspend Ricky's law. Our family is counting on it to save our son. So many families are counting on it. Please oppose Senate Bill 6365. Thank you, and I do, I am here on behalf of many, many moms who could not be here today, many dads who couldn't be here today and as I understand that there is not a sufficient amount of uh, resources and uh, places where they can go, I would really push to make it to where there is more places. There is change. And because the influx of deaths are now up to 172 a day and um, 
I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Pamela Kurgan, and I'm from Puyallup. I'm here today to speak in opposition of Senate Bill 6365. I myself have a child who has spent 10 years in substance use. Meth was her drug of choice. We had many scares for her during that time. Uh, she's been beaten. She's had MRSA at one point with the MRSA. She's had surgery, arm packed, and medication given. She was home and left. I'm also raising my grandson because of her addiction that she's just too sick. Mental illness and substance use go hand in hand. My daughter is also bipolar. My child is now in recovery through the grace of God. However, I'm an administrator for an online support group here in Washington for mothers who have children in substance use disorder. In three short years, our group has grown to almost 1,100 moms, and we have only scratched the surface. Every day, I have a mother who is panicked and looking for help for her child. Some have a child who may have OD'd for the 20th time. One may have a child in the throes of mass psychosis who is walking along a road in ording no shoes or jacket in the middle of winter, but he's carrying a gun. How can we say, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for you or your child? Many of those suffering some substance use disorder also have a mental illness. They are not just someone's child. They are also someone's parent. Everyone deserves treatment. To stop Ricky's law would once again send the message that they aren't worthy. I'm here to say my child is worthy. I'm here to say that every child that belongs to a mother in my group is worthy. We need to start saving them. I hope that the state of Washington will be a leader in this country dealing with an epidemic where 174 people a day die. Let's show everyone in this country that Washington can be a leader in making a change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel will be Ed Peterson and Michelle Carrera. So I can get it big enough to read. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm at Peterson. I'm testifying in opposition to Senate Bill 6365. My son Ryan has battled addiction, excuse me. I was gonna hold it together. It's okay, Ed. <laughs> and my, my, Ryan, my Ryan has battled addiction for the past seven years and is currently in long-term recovery. Unless you and your family have been directly impacted by addiction, it's difficult to comprehend the battles that we have to live every day. On too many occasions in both Seattle and Tacoma, I've taken medicine to the hospital for fear of him dying or killing himself. And before we have time to sit down, they let him go where he leaves. And he's back in the street by himself, left to us trying to keep him alive. Me and my wife are not qualified to do this effectively. What hurts about the process is you know your son is killing himself, has no control over the drug. He doesn't realize he needs the help. And when we take him to get the professional help, they either can't or couldn't help us legally. I cannot tell you how frustrating this is. I wish this feeling is of hopelessness on nobody. Ricky's law helps to minimize some of the roadblocks and get help for those who don't realize how much they need the help. Before I read the last line, I can't imagine as a retired high school principal that I have a capacity for 1,700 kids and I have 1,900 come in and register and I tell two of them, 200 of them to go home. That's not gonna happen. It shouldn't happen when we're talking about 
our children's lives. Please do the right thing and don't suspend Ricky's law. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michelle Kerr. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having me and other committee members. I am in opposition to Senate Bill 6365. My 25 year old son has been battling substance use disorders since he was 18. Last August in the evening, I heard a loud crashing noise. I ran upstairs to find my son AG on the floor unconscious. He had white foam around his mouth and his face, neck, chest, arms and hands were turning dark blue. Panic set in because I've been through this before two years prior. This was an overdose. I called 911. My husband tried shaking our son to wake him up and when he wouldn't, he began CPR. AJ finally started breathing on his own and was able to get up and his skin tone began to look normal. EMTs were there within minutes, took vitals and suggested he go to the emergency room. However, our son refused medical advice and didn't go. Less than 12 hours later, I found my son overdosed again on our boat in the driveway of our home, bluish gray, foam around his mouth, not breathing and making faint gurgling sounds. Again, I called 911. The same first responders that had come the night before came that morning. They were just as shocked and horrified as I was. Thankfully, they administered the overdose reversal medication, Narcan. However, they took him immediately to the ER this time. Approximately two and a half hours later, I receive a call from AJ asking me to pick him up. The ER was releasing him. I was in absolute disbelief. I needed to know why they were releasing him so soon after having back-to-back -back overdoses. After speaking with a nurse, he explained to me, matter of factly, your son is stabilized and cannot stay here any longer. I pleaded with him that the chances of another overdose happening today, one that could cause him to die would be great and they must keep him. However, the nurse said since he didn't pose a threat to anyone or himself, they could not legally detain him. I again pleaded, he is a threat to himself because of this drug, because of his drug use. He's my only child, we need help. And that's where I was stopped and the nurse said, we don't recognize addiction as being a threat. The fear and frustration of that day still runs deep within me. No one should ever have to witness the horror of seeing their child overdosed or loved one overdosed. My son and many others who suffer with opioid use disorder need all the help that's available to them to battle this disease. Ricky's Law would be a huge step in helping families like mine and theirs to stop the self-destructive cycle of addiction that leads so many to their death. Please oppose Senate Bill 6365. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, I think we have some questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, first of all, I wanna thank both of you and all the witnesses uh, for sharing your testimony. Um, I was not on this committee um, two years ago when we passed the bill, so I was not directly involved in the debate. I believe I did vote for, for it. But I guess what I wanna, was wondering if you'd give me a sense as someone who's probably somewhat newer to this issue than my colleagues, what, what did you do in terms of trying to find treatment options for your children in terms of, and give me a sense of what the barriers were, if possible, knowing that, you know, um, they're, they're not minor children that right. you're dealing with. That when, the, when the issue starts, um, we have plenty of insurance, which is not an issue. And you say you're a principal, sir? I was, I retired from yeah. public education. And, but so in the very beginning, you have it when stuff happens. And even if I didn't have it, I was fortunate enough to be financially able to do some things, all right? But there's such a wind of opportunity on some things when they need the help. Because after a while, now he's on state insurance because mm -hmm. things have to take place. Well, the problem comes is state insurance doesn't cover some things. Mm -hmm. The number of beds is so limited. I mean, you can't leave counties. You have to do it in certain counties to get into a certain bed if you have no insurance. What county are you in? Tacoma, Pierce. Pierce. Mm -hmm. And so, so then they, you just, you, you drop them off. They want to help you. It's not that they didn't want to help us. And then when you go to a detox facility and they call you back and he's sitting on the front step, 
those the, the, the obstacles and the, the sad part is is every one of us tell the same story of this disease and this addiction and the, the barriers in front of you. Today you can't go in there if you were to want to yourself. If you wanted to go try and find it right away, you would not have a clear path there. There's not a clear path. And there's not a way you can't you can't call somebody in the hospital and all of a sudden get the directions for those things to happen. You have to have somebody with like Lauren in a sense. I wish we could make more of her because she makes road signs for so many people to navigate some of these things. I volunteer every week in Seattle to feed the homeless and to meet them where they're at. No judgment. If somebody comes up that day and says, I want help, I cannot guarantee him that he can get into a facility to save his life. And that window of opportunities, it could be gone in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is, is some counties are doing good. I have to give props to Everett. At least if a young man or young woman walks into that building there at the police station, they will at least attempt to get him someplace or get them someplace. I can't say that for all the parts of Washington. And the systems that we have in place is, Trust me, I pay taxes. I know I don't want that burden, and I know my son's a burden on some things. Mm -hmm. But I also am a parent, and I have to control that his ability to meet some of those goals, and those he has to navigate them. If I can't navigate him with a master's degree, how is somebody who's going to be impacted on this disgusting drug going to be able to navigate it? Right. Yeah. Right. And so that's very helpful. Thank you very much. How old is your son? He's 27 right now. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Yeah. With that, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 6365. And we'll